well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? We have a show for the working class today. Yeah, this is a blue collar show on Double my, Feature. Uh, my name is Eric, and I'm here today with. I was going to call you Working Stiff, Michael Kester, oh, but then yeah. you were you are not. Work, I'm going to no. introduce you to the working world today. I'm going to yeah, tell you all that's what's about, about to happen it. here. Um, we have two movies we are covering on the show today. Uh-huh. We're going to try and wake people up from their nine to five comas. All right. Uh, what are what are these working class movies? We're going to do Glen Gary, Glen Ross, and Shaun of the Dead. That is certainly what we're going to do on the show. These are films that have some spoilers in them, mm-hmm. but mostly I think you just need to see the goddamn movies. Yep. So uh, they're probably not huge spoilers. Yeah, kind of huge. Yeah, yeah, they're spoilers. All films are spoilable in someone's eyes, mine and yours. Except for the shows where you claim that's not true. Yeah, but even those are kind of spoilable. So you can use the chapters mm-hmm. in, uh, in the actual podcast itself right. to skip over Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and uh, go over to Shaun of the Dead, which you've probably seen, and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, I'm assuming you haven't seen. I'm just going to make these <laughs> assumptions about our listening audience. Oh, or you could skip Shaun of the Dead. You can go sure. to the end of the show. Pretty fucking simple. Kind of speaks for itself, those chapters. I wanted to begin with Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. You know and what's really interesting about Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? What's really interesting, the rest of humanity? Well, the, I see you have something to tell me about this movie. The thing that's really fascinating about Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross is that any time you mention the fucking name of the movie, uh-huh. the only thing anybody ever fucking tells you is that Alec Baldwin wasn't originally <laughs> in the script. Wow, that's his fascinating. Character, and instead they wrote him in for the movie because Ooh. he was so good. Yeah, amazing. That's Thanks. all anybody fucking knows about this movie. You know, I had weird. never seen it. I'm sorry. I had yeah. never seen it mm-hmm. before we did it today for the show. Yeah. And all I've ever heard, whenever it's mentioned, whenever I bring it up, whenever I tell people, mm-hmm. oh yeah, we're doing that for double feature. The right. only thing. Alec Baldwin's part wasn't originally in that movie, did yeah. you know? Wasn't in the uh, the stage, the play. And the he's so fucking good. David, yeah, uh, I understand that. Mamet, uh, right? David Mamet. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with David Mamet as the rest of the universe. I am as familiar with Alec Baldwin as the rest of the universe. Mm-hmm. He's in that one show a lot of people like. Right. And um, a lot of people have that little piece of trivia. Yeah. Right? So we're in a weird position where we either talk about that on the show or risk getting every single member of Podmanity emailing us, letting us know. Yeah. Did you know? In fact, we did know. But let's talk about the rest of the movie, which is far superior to that tidbit. Um, I want to outline our players a little bit here before we dive into this. This is going to be uh, kind of the rat race of the two shows. Sure. You know, we're going to focus on a couple different things about the working environment that most of humanity finds itself in. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, I think Rat Race is probably the best, the best way to, mm-hmm. to group this out. We're going to talk about sales a lot, too. Yeah. We have some goddamn salesmen we in do. this movie. We have, uh, we have four salesmen, we have a Spacey, and we have a cop. Yeah, that's true. We also have Jonathan Price playing a Mark, oh, which Jonathan is Price. pretty great. Who Jonathan Price is our uh, good buddy from Brazil. Yeah, right. Also uh, in De Lovely way back year one. Oh, was he? I don't even remember He's that. Gabriel, the angel that sure. talks to Cole <laughs> right. Porter in the meta version of the play of his life. His wife in this movie is the smartest person in the film, <laughs> and she is not even in the film. There is, believe it or not. Not a single woman in this entire film. There are a few female characters that are referred to, maybe talked to on the phone. Right. I know that the wife has a the, daughter. Yeah. And there's something with the wives of the sales mm-hmm. marks. And then, yeah. yeah, that's really it. It's weird for me to have a movie that is so very close to my heart and has not a single female role. And I don't think the fact that there are no women in this really says anything about the role of women. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't say that there's any gender commentary on this whatsoever. Uh, Al Pacino is playing Ricky Roma. And uh, this is one of Al Pacino's, I'm going to say, one of his more measured roles. But we've talked about him on the show before. Sure. Specifically in Insomnia, I think was the uh, the big Pacino movie. This was actually recommended to us by a couple people who emailed um, after we'd already kind of scheduled it for the show anyways. 
but uh, they had uh, both pointed it out as, oh, here's a role where Al Pacino doesn't just scream the right. entire time. Sure. And uh, fucking smooth as the hell in this movie. And we'll we'll talk about Dark Roma. and evil and... <laughs> right, like I the mean, rest of the people. Really, yeah. And, yeah, so there's Ed Harris, too. Ed Harris plays Moss. Ed Harris, one of my... One of my I almost said favorite actor, but I don't actually have those. Yeah. He's one of the actors I really enjoy watching. Ed Harris we saw in The Rock. Yeah, in The Rock. Um, also have Alan Arkin, who I don't think's ever been on the show Never before. Never been on the show. Who but... plays George. Yeah. And then Jack Lemmon, who needs to be discussed at great length uh, on today's episode. But he's playing Shelley Levine. Levine's a uh, machine. Is his last name, Levine. And then there's Kevin Spacey, who's Williamson, mm-hmm. who's kind of sort of the boss, but sort of the facilitator he's, yeah, around the office. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, yeah, I don't know where you would call him because it doesn't seem like he has, it seems like he has a lot of power and very small role in the uh, business. Sort of an admin, strange mm-hmm. admin position he has. And then we have Buzz Cut Cop. Yeah, the cop who, it's a shame that the cop isn't highlighted a bit more. It's not because, I mean, I feel like this is one of those perfectly written uh, movies and everything is is done far better than I could ever imagine. However, I say that just because the cop is probably the only good person yeah. in this fucking movie, besides uh, Jonathan Price's wife. If you've ever been in sales, if you've ever done any sales, anything in your life, you know all of these people. <laughs> you know every fucking one of these people. Uh, it's it's really amazing getting these kind of caricatures mm-hmm. down and... Uh, you know, I use the word caricatures, but it's really just these people. Yeah. It's your top dog, hotshot, smooth talking mm-hmm. salesman. It's the old timer who had all these old ways. Sure. It's the fucking people that complain yeah. to no end. It's uh, it's the boss who doesn't know what the hell he's yep. doing with his life. And it's all coming down to the leads and commission. Oh God, the leads. So I want to talk briefly just about setting up uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross as, uh, you know, kind of visually the aesthetic. Okay. Of what's going on. That's in the movie. a weird place to go with this. I'm, I'm it really interested to, to see. Yeah, it certainly is. And I don't want to talk about it a whole lot, but I feel like we need to address, first of all, the gels, the colored lighting. Okay. Yeah, um, for sure. Specifically in the beginning, you know, you have you have that very moody saxophone, mm-hmm. too. That kind of jazzy thing that that comes back around. The shady um, Chinese restaurant. Right. Yeah, it almost has a, a Chinatown kind of yeah. vibe to this whole, you know, that uh, Jack Nicholson film. About the some of that, <laughs> Some of that old noir stuff. But you start in the red phone booths with the blue light. Mm-hmm. These perfectly, perfectly quarantine lighting. I mean, no bleed over between the two. It's a really, it's a very visually appealing set to... You know, to come from something that has its background in theater. Well, it's kind of an odd thing to see in a film that's, you know, very much about the working man, mm-hmm. the dead end kind of job. Yeah. It's weird to see bright colors and, and contrasts of blue and sharp reds in this Chinese restaurant. It's a weird place to begin, especially considering the second half takes place in a, you know, typically lit office yeah the second half of the movie is is basically all in one room Mm -hmm. and it's daylight and so i think there's some uh, some pretty great lengths that the movie goes through to set up mood especially considering you know they go out to start making all these calls and talking to these people and it's late at night Mm -hmm. and so that's where you get that you know that really thick rain um the cta running by all the time uh, I think the the play was originally in Chicago, although I don't really know if the yeah. movie has a if setting set, to yeah. it. Yeah, and the thing that I think it really sets to accomplish, especially as you pointed out in that opening scene in the Chinese restaurant, mm-hmm. is it makes them all seem like shady guys. Yeah, it does. Um, it There's immediately some, presents, some backroom deal going sure, on here. It immediately presents this thing where all of the guys are kind of slimy, mm-hmm. and even though later on, it without that kind of initial exposure to those guys in a shady looking place sure you might sympathize with certainly someone like levine right because he's just an old man trying to make ends meet but when you start out in such a clearly dark yeah environment it gives you a very distinct image of the characters that you're dealing with well plus i think a lot of people can probably identify with these characters sure. or certainly people who've had time in sales and you don't want to go into a movie talking about all of these evil people and identifying with them. So, you know, that lighting separates this from reality. 
by the time you get to the second half of the movie, you know how you feel about all these people. So whatever the choice in lighting is is there for, it certainly helps to separate you know those two halves, but mm-hmm. also to stress you out towards the beginning. Because when you get to that second half, really fucking stressful. Yeah, it is. It's uh, like some of the scenes of violence we've talked about and yeah. tension in some of these horror movies, but over the course of an hour, maybe. Yeah, the whole time I'm just sitting there expecting a gunshot to go off and someone's sure. head to explode. Just either some sort of crazy... Some kind of release from the tension. Yeah, really. some kind of... I mean, it seems like it's building and building and building. Right. And it really just kind of relaxes in a really unsettling way. So we begin with the leads. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we're going to talk about the first half of the movie, it, really, there's bitching about the leads <laughs> through yeah. the entire movie, but... The good leads, man. You got to have those good leads. And we need better leads. Bitch and bitch and bitch. It's so not fair what's happening to these poor guys. It's really what I liked about, or where I really saw the movie going at the beginning, Mm -hmm. was you get these four guys, four different guys. They're all taunted with these great leads, the Mm -hmm. Glengarry leads. Yeah, and then given what they could leads. have. Yeah, <laughs> right. And then you, I thought what it was going to be was, here's how four different guys handled, you know, the fact that their job was on the line and they would all go about it different ways. Right. And originally, it looked like Levine was going to be the upstanding, I'm just going to work really hard and hopefully right. it'll pay off. And Not that this was a story about cynicism right. and corruption. and Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the evils of the, <laughs> the working world. Yeah, you know, I also like that, though, that they all have equally shitty leads. Yeah. They all complain about it, and those complaints are invalid enough because it's just people, you know, if you have a job, you whine about your job. That's what people with jobs do. They complain about how it's not fair and how everybody has it better and how if only these three things were different, then this would be a great place they were in. And the the painful sort of irony of this is that they all have the same leads and they're all in competition with each other. Mm Mm-hmm. So it may be understandably frustrating for them to try and get any sales, but it's not like they're competing with somebody who has great leads. They all have shit. So that's when George and Moss uh, start doing that thing where, you know, misery loves company. They don't actually do any work. They just complain about the work that, you know, that hypothetically they could do if they had these great leads. They start talking about how better it is at other companies and man, we could just go to these other places, but they don't do anything about it. No, they just complain and talk about how it doesn't even matter if we're working right now. I'm just going to go drink because it's not even like it matters if I work because I don't have the lead, so who cares? They just have conversations justifying their shitty conversations. They have conversations that justify them not actually trying to better their lives. This gets into that thing where they're talking about war stories. These are a bunch of assholes sitting around exchanging war stories, particularly these two guys. These type of work stories that uh, I know you've never had a lot of involvement in the corporate world. Yeah, I worked, honestly, my, the closest thing I've ever had to anything in a corporate world is I worked at a printing company for a couple of years, but I was not really doing anything involved with the company. I was kind of walking around. Sort of had your own thing to do. I was a gopher. People would just ask me to do this and that, and I would just do it, make a spreadsheet. Since starting working when I was younger, having bullshit jobs at the mall mostly, but I think back to, uh, I worked at a a big electronics store in kind of, I think it was the late 90s, or uh, one of the ones that's no longer in business, Mm -hmm. one of the ones whose name is Circuit City, you know, one of those types of stores, or maybe that that chain in particular. Yeah. And that was my exposure to the sales environment. And uh, I guess I saw that before working there, although it, it, there were, you know, bullshit stores in the mall where they sold goth pants. I mean, it wasn't really right. a, where a you sales goth pressure, pants. right? <laughs> it wasn't a sales pressure environment sure. so much as, you know, working at somewhere where people... There's difference between yeah. retail and sales. Although retail can certainly include sales. Oh, yeah, you know, absolutely. You, you well, see something retail... Something like electronics, you get bigger items. And people create these stories, these uh, these boring work stories which you can easily identify by the initial phrase, I had a guy. Mm -hmm. That's all you need. And then you just know to fucking turn off. There is nothing of any value coming out of this conversation. It will be the most boring fucking story that nobody cares about you'll ever hear. I had a guy came in the other day. Hey, I was talking to this one guy. This guy came in the other day. He said, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, you can't. 
God, the most boring <laughs> fucking least contribution to humanity conversations you could ever hear two people have. It's enough to make you stab yourself in the goddamn eardrums. And that's the, the stories these guys are all exchanging. Yeah. I mean, especially, uh, you know, when Levine comes back and he starts telling his war story. Sure. Right. I had them there in the living room and I was all like, man, you gotta, you gotta it just take it. It's so and boring. It's such It really, bullshit. and nobody cares. Nobody, yeah. even, even coworkers kind of pretend to care. But man, you, once you separate yourself with that fourth wall, once you're sitting on a couch eating popcorn instead of sitting in an office, God damn damn do you realize how yeah. awful those stories are I, and the point where he's he's talking about how i just held the pen there yeah right. and then i held it for he's trying five to make minutes, an epic out of it and i looked at the clock and i shit you not i held that pen for 22 minutes <laughs> i'm sitting there thinking these people must have been just as bored as i am listening to it well they just, it's amazing to hear later that they wanted to talk who wants to talk to salespeople? crazy people yeah they exist they do exist it's uh Oh, God, it's kind of amazing, but kind of awful. You know, the thing that gets me about these stories, too, is that uh, listening to this guy talk, I mean, he was sweating blood to get these people to sign. Yeah. He's got a job that he does. He is a salesman. And maybe he's good at the job. Maybe not. Certainly some of these guys are great at the job. And so it does take skill not to sell mm -hmm. that short. Being a swindler, a fucking capitalistic con artist takes a little bit of skill. I should also frame this conversation by saying that I'm the largest fan of capitalism. You will. Have. How many jokes were there about libertarianism and the free market in our year-end show? A lot. Above also, quota, I believe. Were about equal jokes of uh, librarians and libertarians. So this is coming from a capitalist. Mm -hmm. And normally I can defend capitalism and defend markets as a great way to see, well, if people like ideas, they pay for them, they support them. That exchange of money is uh, I would go as far as to say would equal world peace. It is how we achieve world peace. I'm going to go the Penn and Teller bullshit methodology on that. But even coming from me, I'm listening to this guy talk about how hard he's worked. And I identify that he has, although he's putting it to no use, he has a skill he is exercising and he seems to be doing it incredibly on, mm -hmm. uh, on his marks here. And I'm thinking no one has ever worked harder in the history of man to contribute nothing to the planet. To contribute absolutely fucking nothing yeah, to planet Earth. not at all. Humanity gains nothing. It's fucking vapor. There's nothing. It's empty. Well, that's, that's kind of the unfortunate skeleton behind real estate. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're basically selling people something that's already there. You haven't created anything. You mean just selling people plots of land? Right. It's like stocks, right? Yeah. It's like stocks that are made of dirt. I'm not going to pretend to know anything about yeah, real estate. Yeah, I don't know fucking shit. I'll take pictures of real estate. I don't know how to sell or <laughs> apparently even purchase real estate. I'm not very good at. It seems like one of those environments, sort of like retail, where you almost don't even need people to be involved in that interaction. Right. You know, I might have some questions about a place, but... If we could just have, I don't know, an MLS database with all the land in it, and then I could just pick out the piece of land I want and I go look at it, maybe check in with somebody at a desk who could answer a couple questions for me. Sure. I don't need a person there to talk me in to buying yeah. that piece of land. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to call for the end of all salespeople. I think salespeople have a, uh, a purpose in the world where they can help facilitate transactions, Sure, but not where they're there to make transactions for you or to upscale transactions. I suppose all salespeople think they're facilitating a transaction. That's probably how they yeah, sleep at night. Exactly. But I if was you, just going to say that. If you are a high-pressure salesman, I mean, those people need to be replaced with goddamn robots. Mm -hmm. You start to see the byproduct of all of these guys' jobs, how, what it does to their personal life, You know, it, just in how they communicate with each other. There's a great cover for Glengarry Glen Ross. It's probably the cover I'll end up using for the artwork on the show. If not, find it on our website or something where it's just uh, two men in suits shaking hands. Their right hand is for shaking and their left hand has a knife held behind their back. Huh. You know, you see them basically trying to put the swindle on each other. Right. You see uh, Levine, he's getting in the car trying to get these leads from Williams and he's negotiating with sure. him. Right. He's trying to talk him down in price. He's telling him like, look, I'm trying to be a straight shoot, which he's is another being a thing. salesman. Yeah, that's. That's part of the salesman dialogue is you talk about how you're not going to bullshit someone yeah. and how you are going to be 
hey, I can see you don't buy into the sales stuff that right. everybody else does. I'm going to give it to you straight. I want to be straight with you. I want to pay you this much for the leads. Come on, let's level. This is going to be I'm going to be completely honest. I do get a commission from this sale, but right. that's not really why I'm here. Oh my God. I went to buy a mattress uh, a couple months ago and I was getting that shit left and right from people selling mattresses. <laughs> Do you remember when I moved to the city, actually? And we had uh, our gay mattress outing? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't think we've ever told this on the air. This oh, will be, really? I'll try and make it brief because there's so much to talk about here. But I came to the city and I was in, uh, let's call it involuntary isolation in uh, normal Illinois for about a year. I didn't even make it a year. And I finally got out. I came to the city. I needed to buy a bed. Mm-hmm. I knew nobody in the city. I knew few people in the city. Yeah. Few people with as much free time as yourself. Let's, right. let's uh, narrow it down to that. And so I said, Michael... I got to find a bed. Where do they sell beds? What the fuck am I doing here? My previous apartment was furnished for me. I don't know what's going on. I was kind of going a little nuts. Uh And so you said, don't worry about it. Let's just go to a mattress store. We'll pick up a bed. We'll have them deliver it to your place. And so this is probably the gayest thing you and I have ever done together. We went mattress shopping. Yep. uh, Which is a little amusing in retrospect because thinking back to how the salespeople approached us. Yeah. Sometimes they were aware that I just wanted to pick up a bed and get the hell out of there. And sometimes they weren't really sure. They kept asking us both to lay down on the (laughs) beds. Right. They weren't really sure what our relationship was. They would show, they would show, you know, larger beds and then you would kind of walk and I would stand behind and then they would shift and go, are you looking for a twin? (laughs) Right. Right. So they were trying to find the angle with which to, we really should have treated that as performance art and ran with it. Uh, unfortunately, we're not good enough artists, I suppose. But that's part of the the training. You live that shit day in and day out, and so you can't get away from it, even in your personal life. There's that same sort of, you know, hey, we're just talking here. We're that, just speaking. Uh, we're not talking about right, anything. That George and Moss have in the bar that, mm-hmm. you know, that these guys say to each other throughout the movie, hey, hey, hey this is just two guys talking. I mean, uh, fuck, Levine says the same goddamn thing to Williamson, you know, a couple scenes before it. We're just talking here. This is just, hey, let's level. Let's just be human beings for a second. Right. You know, we don't have a work relationship. We're just going to level let's like lose human titles. Beings. Oh, my God. So of all these people here, who is the most underhanded? Or are oh. they all just different kinds of underhanded? Oh, man, that is a good question. I don't know. I was going to say, hands down, Levine, mm-hmm. um, because he is Because he liar. commits a, an actual crime he's, and well, not just is a terrible a, human I th- being. I feel like it's, yeah, he's a liar. And he's a thief, and then he tries to bribe his way out of <laughs> sure. conviction. Sure, right. Um, but he's but, also one of the more sympathetic characters, just yeah. because he's sad and old and has a kid. The other thing for me is that I just I feel like Roma is so dirty. Yeah. Jonathan Price's character is so frail and mm-hmm. broken, and Roma keeps trying to get around with the wordplay. Like, what do you mean three days? Three days from when? What day yeah, was the check right. cash? I don't know. Saturday doesn't count. You can't count Saturday. Yeah, right. And that feels really slimy, too, because this guy's on the brink of tears. Yeah, right. So I don't know. I would definitely... They would be probably two of my higher votes. He certainly... Uh, I mean, Roma is one of the smoothest, and that may make him the slimiest, just kind of by default. There's that scene where he's trying to keep Jim into the deal. I mean, that is that has to be the pinnacle of the awful thing. But it, also, where he's talking to Jim in the bar earlier, yeah. and you almost think, maybe this is the only person who's not pulling a deal right now. Sure. And then you start to see how this is. I mean, it's a long con, mm-hmm. right? That's really he's, what it is, yeah. He's trying to buddy up to this guy. And when he is trying to keep Jim into that deal in the office... There is so much stress there. I mean, so much of it. It's hard to deal with as an audience. Yeah. And it's not enough just being a complete fucking liar. But then you see Jim apologize when he leaves. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Roma has worked this con on him so much that Jim believes it. And only his wife, who's, who's, you know, outside of this interaction, can look in on it and say, that's a bad deal. You're getting out of that. Just go and do it. Fuck, she might have been talked into it, too, if she showed up. That was her smartest move, is not going with. Just saying, do not come home until you get that check back. But he leaves, and he says, man, I let you down. I know I let you down. I'm a terrible person. He looks like a broken man. You're actually seeing Roma destroy lives here. He's just tearing these people down. And I don't want to let Williamson off with a free pass, either. Mm -hmm. Because uh, he kind of is sort of the hero at the end. He finds the... You know, the thing about being a hero... is (laughs) is <laughs> what's the thing about being a hero tell me i'm pretty sure if you get what you want with the wrong intentions 
it doesn't make you. He, he's not turning Levine in because it's the just sure. thing to do. He's you're turning right. Levine in to screw Levine. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That does not make him a hero at all. It does put him in the most, let's say, heroic position yeah. thematically. But no, he's doing it for the wrong reasons. Right. And so that makes it wrong. It doesn't matter what he's actually doing. Sure. But in the beginning, it's even clearer. I mean, he's a complete dick. He stands by while Alec Baldwin's giving his sure. outrageous speech. And then he's trying to milk Levine for a bribe once right. he realizes the situation he's right. in. And once again, he doesn't take a bribe, not because bribes are unethical, right. but instead because Levine doesn't have enough money. Right. Because he didn't get a good enough yeah. bribe. Correct results, uh, unethical, you know, action. I wrong believe reasons. we call that the ends don't justify the means. Thank you. You know, I've been using words like con artist quite a bit. I don't know. Do you kind of identify with that? Yeah, I totally understand what you're saying by con artist. The I thing mean, is, Levine especially, right? Yeah. You know, well, the things he's saying, it, it's about, almost well, a con. You've won a prize. <laughs> Talk to my secretary. Yeah, they all seem to use these weird... They can't just say, hey, I have some land. Are you right. interested in it? They can't just they facilitate. They say, oh, I'm in for one day from Florida. And <laughs> right. fortunately, you guys were selected to win this prize from everybody in our database. Right. And if I don't get over there tonight, I'm going to have to hand it off to somebody else. And you're really going to be missing out. Right. So they're lying. But when it comes down to it, they're not at the end of the game here. Mm -hmm. They're not lying about what they're doing. It's not like they're walking into a place and saying you know if you if you sign this i'll give you a bunch of money and then right. people sign it and then they're, they don't give them know, a bunch of yeah, money but they're still lying they're and, keeping themselves legally in the clear right i'm sure if they thought they could get away with saying free money yeah sign here <laughs> right right exactly they would so do it you know that's uh that's that conversation they have about just taking the money and what going to tijuana going or whatever to tijuana. You, said. you know if a property was worth it they wouldn't have to swindle. That's really exactly. what it comes down to. Uh, if you have to trick people into, I don't know, thinking a sale was their idea, then I feel like you're doing an unethical job. Mm -hmm. I feel like you should go home fucking hating yourself. Yeah. And I don't want any sort of bullshit about you have to make a living and these people are gullible. They do deserve what you it. Do. And, yeah. No, none of that is okay. We are all just human beings going through this shit together. Yeah, quit screwing and, everybody. And if you are screwing people over, if you need to, <laughs> at the point where you th where you have to make someone else think it's their idea, yeah. that's a con. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, if you're that's, fucking somebody without their permission, there you go. It's financial rape. There you are. Don't do a job you hate. But there's another wonderful aspect of the uh, the working world, mm -hmm. uh, and we need another film to sock people in the face and say, "Hey." Right. Stop doing this shit. Right. Uh, and, uh, well, I was just assuming you're talking about Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, certainly. I, I don't know what gave me that inkling. Maybe it was back in the first chapter when yeah. we talked about the films we were doing today. That's probably it. Um, but this pairing was your idea. It certainly was. This uh, working class thing. I would never have placed Shaun of the Dead as a making fun of working class movie mm -hmm. until you put it in this light. And honestly, that <laughs> totally made it. Yeah. that much better of a film for me. Yeah, a lot of people question this double feature. You know, I have a lot of friends who are in the working world. And then I also have a lot of friends who have uh, graduated themselves out of that world. Uh -huh. They are self-employed. They do things for themselves. There is, uh, there's not much better you could do for yourself than coming to a big city and visiting local businesses right. to make you realize that anyone can have yeah, their own business. Absolutely, Literally anyone can do this. Some of the fucking matchstick places that exist on the same block as our studio mm -hmm. by the really, uh, you know, I can't make a judgment on these people. I don't know them. But what appear at least to be the most incompetent business people you've yeah. ever met in your life. Sure. Cash anybody, registers broken. Please leave money on counter. Anybody could do this. You do not need to do something you don't want for a living. And so you have uh, a rather than dealing with uh, hating yourself for a living. You have something that's almost as bad, which is this sort of apathy, this sort of, I have a nine to five. I don't really, it's just something I got to do. I'm going to get up and check in and then leave at mm -hmm. the end of the day. And I'm going to do it five days a week. And I think the best way to describe this is working for the weekend. Yeah. 
I mean, you get this picture of what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. This is the Waking Dead, right? This is uh, a bit of what Shaun of the Dead is talking about. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about some of the other elements of that. But while we're still in that that business mindset, I really did want to hit on, you know, those those early You really want to hit on the intro to the movie. Yeah, and, you know, this is the fourth zombie movie we've uh, we've covered. I don't even think it's the first movie with slow zombies. I think that was probably... Um, hard Rock Zombies. Hard Rock Zombies, <laughs> right. But we had 28 Weeks Later we covered sure. as well. And we did this, Zack Snyder, John of the Dead. Certainly, certainly. And so, you know, with the opening credits of this movie, we're, um, we're already seeing these people going about their lives as if they were zombies. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, you know, the obvious joke that's being made here. Right is these people, before the infection even happens, are already kind of living the zombie life. Sure. They're just sort of bumbling about yep. in the streets, in going the 7 They're going through the motions. That's exactly Brain what dead, it is. dead, just going through what they assume is what they need to be doing. In hopes that, hey, Friday night, I can go out with my friends, maybe have a beer. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's something that plagues, so to speak. Uh, Sean and his friends yeah. as well, something his girlfriend is complaining about, mm-hmm. is that all he ever wants to do is go to the same fucking pub and, you know, play pub trivia. That's it. That's all his life is composed of. That and time splitters. <laughs> right. Which isn't, I mean, come on, don't rag on the video games too much. I love They're, time splitters. No, not you. I meant the movie. Oh, you sorry. can tell these guys are huge fans of that. Oh, yeah. And we'll get sure. to Big Edgar Wright and all that stuff. So I think the credit sequence is uh, really brilliant, just setting that up, mm-hmm. um, showing the entire town and already already being comedic as well. Right. Just in showing you, here's the townspeople, say they already look like zombies, and then the ideas in your head. So when you get this great longer take of Sean leaving the apartment. Mm-hmm. You're looking in the background for zombies and... And it's the zombies are in the foreground. Right. Uh, you know, you get this take of him doing his daily routine. Sure. And of everybody just kind of going about their business right. like they their their brains not even turned on yet. Mm-hmm. Later, they come back to that, that same sort of point of view shot. And Sean doesn't even realize it. You yeah. Know, and uh, of course, that's the joke. But what I'm getting at is I think this is a, a really great way to, without coming off too heavy, Like I probably am when I spend 25 minutes complaining about salespeople Uh on our show. Right. Uh, You are, it's not necessarily Trojan horsing an idea. Sure. But you let people discover the joke for themselves. Yeah. And then it clicks. And then they know, oh, right. Because they're really not that much worse off as zombies. They're essentially doing the same shit. You almost feel a little reward that you picked up on that, even though. The biggest difference that happens is that the scare shots after about. 25 minutes into the movie are actually things that should make you jump. Right. Because the first 20, 25 minutes of the film, it's just people talking to Sean from out of frame and it pans and it's shakes. It's all sound. And it's you know? just supposed to make you, it's, you know, it's reminiscent of horror movie scare shots, but nothing scary is happening. There's no reason for you to assume that bad things are going to happen. Right. You're using sound to, you know, it plays it up a little bit for jokes. Mm-hmm. And so you've made this connection with the zombies. Uh, The movie is using that to light a fire under your ass. If you perhaps yourself are sitting watching (laughs) six movies a day. Oh, God, help us. (laughs) No, but I mean, if you're going about a daily routine for something you're not passionate for and you don't care and you just want to shut it off when you get home and be done with it, the movie has already made its point to you without Mm -hmm. even really looking like it's trying to make its point to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you see Sean, if it's not obvious enough, go into his job, Mm -hmm. which is crap, which is the most exciting thing that happens at Sean's job. He has read on him. Mm -hmm. That's really it. He's, uh, I don't know, selling TVs or something like he's working at at a circuit city. (laughs) You know, if it was good enough for Joel David Moore, it was good enough for me. It was a long time ago, and I'm I'm glad I left the the world of sinking electronic ships. (laughs) For people who don't know, outside the United States, Circuit City was a chain of, I don't know, computer electronic stores, and they just disappeared because the business sucked, and it was a a terrible place to go, and now we don't have them anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you're young or from overseas, that's what Circuit City was. It was the place that Sean works. Sean works at more like um, uh, Radio Shack. Kind of. Do we still have Radio Shacks? Oh, yeah. Radio Shack will always be around. I believe it's called The Shack now. No. They may tell you different. (laughs) I think there's one on Broadway. Anyways, not the point. 
So let's talk a little bit about the people who made this film. Okay. I'll uh, I'll give you my tiny bit of expertise on this, and you can help fill in some of the uh, okay. the gaps in knowledge that, that I clearly have. Sounds like something that I may be qualified to do. So no, this I'm movie, <laughs> this movie comes from a troop of people. Okay. People that uh, are English. That are English and make these movies, made this, and made Hot Fuzz, and some other stuff we'll talk mm-hmm. about. But at no time was it ever so clear that this came from the TV show called Spaced. Okay. Now, Space was a TV show that we, I don't think, ever had here. I don't have cable TV. No, so I mean, I, it's av- I know that it's available through our various online mediums, such as Hulu.com or Netflix. Excellent. So uh, go check it out, because if you like Shaun of the Dead, it's a lot of the same stuff. It was a show with um, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, uh, a little bit. Nick Frost wasn't one of the lead roles, but was in it as well. And Jessica Stevenson, who's also in this movie. So Simon and Jessica wrote Space. Okay. And uh, Edgar Wright directed Space. All right. Edgar Wright also directed Shaun of the Dead. Absolutely correct. The very movie that we're talking about okay. right now. Okay, I'm starting to see how this is fleshing out. Although you may get a little confused, Space was known for its pop culture references and its, uh, I don't know, let's say machine gun editing techniques. Huh. Again, sounding familiar. Mm-hmm. This was a show that it ran for two seasons as... Uh, two series. Two series. Is that what they call it over there? Do they call it Cross oh, the Pond. That's cute. Two seasons. <laughs> and uh, I think you, you have two seasons and a Christmas special, right? That's how you do every other show. Pretty much. I think that's what The Office did. Misfits as well. Oh, what's that other show? Extras, uh, which had probably the most de- depressing Christmas special of all time. <laughs> you want to talk about some uh, eye-opening, uh, life-changing uh, a cinema? I'm going to keep using the word cinema. I think that's fine. Um, extras, the season finale of that, heavy as fuck. But anyways, Spaced was about these people who got an apartment together. Okay. And uh, I honestly, until right now, assumed it was sci-fi. Oh, no, not at all. No, they get an apartment together and um, they have little tiny episodic adventures. Okay. And their adventures are all kind of, not necessarily homages, but they all have a pretty good hook to them. Okay. Uh, if you've seen Community, I was going to say here, it sounds like Community. You know, Community had a, a flashback episode sure. and a D and D episode and a zombies and a right paintball. paintball that was paintball again. That was kind of how uh, Space has a fucking paintball episode, a great paintball episode. So these were all they're almost like one off mini movies uh, with very light continuing story okay. arcs and a lot of great characters. So if you're loving the Edgar Wright stuff and you want to see, uh, I don't know, two series worth of Edgar Wright shorts. Uh-huh. But that's kind of what Spaced is. Okay. So they did, a, I believe they did a zombie episode, and that's kind of what led them to writing, okay. you know, Shaun, uh, of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead, which gets us back to director Edgar Wright. So Edgar Wright, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost came back a few years after Shaun of the Dead, and they did Hot Fuzz. Right. Now, it is important to note that your two co-hosts of Double Feature uh, were once in a rift sure. over the better Edgar Wright film because you, Eric, mm-hmm. were a fan of... Shaun of the Dead. I think and, it's brilliant. And I, I was all, all for Hot Fuzz. Hot Fuzz... A not brilliant that I film didn't called like, Hot Fuzz. Right. Not that I didn't like Shaun, Shaun of the, the Dead, Dead. Certainly. Preferred Hot Fuzz. Right. Totally a fair option. But now... Would you say it's your flavor of ice cream? Yeah, that's fine. But now we are united because as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know of you, we have the same favorite Edgar Wright film. Which is Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Absolutely. I mean, from a technical standpoint, you <laughs> just can't. We talked about that last year on the show when we sure. paired it strangely with uh, Tron. Hmm. And I talked about my arcade fetish for quite some time. The reverb on that Eurythmics track, though. Seriously. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot to love about this guy and really the, the camp of people that works on his stuff. You know, the very distinct style, the quick transitions with the zoom in and out sure. and the, the sound, the stuff we talked about with that uh-huh. shoelace uh, kind of shot. Right. Something that makes Shaun of the Dead really made it stand out from a lot of the other zombie stuff right. that was coming in kind of years to follow. Right. Well, and also a technique that Edgar Wright ended up parodying of himself when he did the Grindhouse trailer. Oh, yeah. The trailer called Don't. Yeah. Um, I had that in my notes, and then I, I, I'm glossing through, and I'm like, what did I mean by don't? <laughs> I meant Will Arnett from Arrested Development needs to give you some sweet voiceover. A don't is often the untalked about yeah. one on here well, on Double it's Feature. It's the one without a plot. <laughs> right. So back uh, in the limited time when Planet Terror and Death Proof 
were linked together back to back mm-hmm. for one low low price at your local cinema. Three you times. could find I went three uh, times opening day. You oh my god, I saw that movie so many times when it came out. Excuse me, those films. I saw those movies uh so many times when they came out. The trailers in between were the Rob Zombie trailer we talk about all the time, Werewolf Women. Machete. Machete, of course, which uh, happened at the beginning of Planet Terror. An Eli Roth thing where he fucks a turkey or he is heads on a turkey that's getting fucked. Come on, don't pretend like you don't know the Thanksgiving trailer scene oh, by scene. Oh, I know it. And, uh, and sometimes if you're in Canada, maybe Hobo with a Shotgun. But there was also the Edgar Wright trailer called Don't. And it mocked uh, things that people think maybe they should do in horror films. Right. Think you should do that? Don't. There you have it. So Shaun of the Dead is the first in what's supposed to be the Blood and Ice Cream trilogy. A uh, joke, apparently, about ice cream in the UK. But uh, Hot Fuzz is the second. And the third, it seems to be nowhere on the radar of anybody okay. who's making films right now. All right. So each of these movies is a, uh, a different flavor of said ice cream. And here we start with the first. More interesting to me than favorite desserts here on Double Feature, if I ever have to hear you talk about snow cones again, I will kill myself. (laughs) This is the beginning of the zombie comeback. Do you remember the zombie comeback? Yeah, no, I... I, We discussed it a little bit in 20 weeks later. Well, because 28 days later was the beginning of this. Shaun of the Dead is a huge component. Yeah, definitely. And now zombies are really popular again. And still, I would say still, I don't know if they've gone away. Well, that's in the what last... I mean. I mean, again, as of since the first time oh, back right. in the 80s. So part of the appeal of this movie is you and your friends realistically fight zombies. Yeah. Who doesn't like thinking about that? Absolutely. That was uh, that was not only the appeal of this, but of the Max Brooks uh, books that came out, the zombie survival guide, sure. that sort of thing. Um, World War Z, which at the time we're recording this, I believe is still attempting to get made somehow uh-huh. into, uh, into a film. Sure. Around the time that they throw a pillow at a zombie is when I realized sure. that this is exactly what would happen if a zombie ended up in my apartment. Oh yeah. The pillow that I mean, that's the definitive moment. You start thinking, oh, you would start throwing things and you know, this is really in a lot of ways a tribute to fans of zombies. The sure. people who stay in their uh, apartments, lofts or whatever the fuck they're called flats over right. there. And throw things and play video games. Yeah, often we get the uh, the uh, superhero, everyday person becomes a hero, but right. we have never really since gotten what happens if a normal boring dude has to fight zombies. Yeah, we may have gotten that, uh, that set up a bit, but we certainly never get it as smart as it's been done here. Agreed. I mean, this seems to stand out as if it's doing something completely separate. I feel like anytime I see a zombie movie, there's always a little bit of... Hey, what if you and your friends were defending yourselves? Right, from... but event- at any point during the other zombie movies, it's what if you and your friends were and then discovered a bastion of weapons? Right, not just lock yourself in your local hangout. So I mean it when I say it's the smartest take that's that's really been done here. But uh, certainly it, it says something that it is itself a great zombie movie. Absolutely. The uh, The zombies, I mean, zombies usually get themselves right. Zombies Mm -hmm. sell themselves. People will sign up for any boring TV series that has zombies, you know, flailing around in the background. Terrible. Terrible. But instead, again, as we've talked about so many times, uh, you know, see the Cloverfield episode. We're using um, the genre as a comedy vehicle. Mm -hmm. Zombies take care of themselves. Don't worry about the zombies. Don't worry about stupid rules. You're going to write a smart, funny comedy. A, uh, I believe it was labeled the tagline. Romantic comedy with zombies. Thank you. You're just a fucking tagline machine. (laughs) And so we find ourselves in something that was well written because it probably didn't, you know, the the premise was let's go write a great zombie thing. Sure. But the, uh, the life's work was let's write incredible comedy bits. And zombies happen to be the package here. Absolutely. One thing that uh, definitely separates this when looking at Edgar Wright's work from something like Scott Pilgrim. Mm -hmm. Uh, Scott Pilgrim, we talked a lot about the 16-bit kind of whatever video game stuff, the effects, the graphic overlays, the 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 shiny stuff. Right. Coins, laser, flame swords, whatever (laughs) the fuck was going on in that movie. You look at the cover of that movie and you know, I mean, there's just bright, crazy shit flying at you all over the place. And we're certainly not knocking that because we just had a Scott Pilgrim love fest back on that show. But Shaun of the Dead is a lot different in the effects. They are all really simple, smart 
Sure. Effects. There's very, very few, uh, maybe a couple composites, yeah. but not a lot of special effects work. No, not really. One of the great examples is uh, when Sean sort of falls asleep. In the kitchen, where he writes the thing on the whiteboard and then exactly, falls asleep. Exactly, exactly. You know what I'm talking about. The, it's dark out, and then it shows the next day, and it appears that he's just, you know, you know there's a joke about sure. it. The lights have just kicked on. He stayed there the entire night, instant time lapse. But rather than doing something complicated, it really appears to me, not an expert here, it yeah. appears that they just turned the lights on. Yeah, that's really what it looks like. And I think, uh, you know, you use the sound to really right. sell that. Absolutely. There's lots of sound throughout the movie that makes it feel like it's a huge budget thing. You know, it makes the... Uh, what would otherwise just be a sort of run-of-the-mill romantic comedy, um, budget-wise or pacing-wise, mm-hmm. it certainly wouldn't be action. That's what I'm getting at. Agreed. What separates this from you know romantic comedy to action, what elevates it to this kind of action-packed romantic comedy, mm-hmm. is really sound. Yeah. I mean, it's makeup too. There's fucking zombies in it. You sure. can't. You can't really. Sure, get, but there's a lot of that. a lot of whooshing and panic. Yeah, right. And just it really is the the squishing and the running and the it makes terror. it feel like there's more action than yeah, there really is. Absolutely. Uh, this is not necessarily a movie where you need a bunch of stunt people. However, it feels like a movie where you need a bunch of stunt sure. people. Well, you need you need a record hitting someone's head to sound like a fucking boomerang, right? With a razor blade on it to sound like a video game. Yeah. You know, slow zombies help that out quite a bit because then you don't even have to worry about people running around. You just have people kind of lumbering towards you. You know, that scene where they're coming out of Liz's uh, apartment where Sean's bringing everybody back out is a perfect example. He tells them all just, you know, find a blunt object and follow me. And I don't think anyone swings their blunt object in the entire film. I think uh, they just grab some stuff to carry with them. But he has this cricket paddle. Sure. And he's running from person to person, whacking them with a paddle. Uh Uh-huh. And it feels like he's in a war film. Sure. You know, it feels like he's really in some heavy combat. And that he's a fucking slaughterhouse. Yeah. This is some Arnold Schwarzenegger shit happening here. And instead, it's uh, it's an actor with uh, what's probably a foam paddle just running around bonking people. Honestly, the zombies even get back up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So they're not, you know, they're not that wounded. But by applying an effect... Like you just fucking bulldoze somebody every time sure. you hit them with this thing, it feels like a high budget action film. That's one of the the moments where a simple element of sound absolutely sells it. For sure. And being a comedy, you can get away with a lot of that stuff too. If you were to really pay attention to that, it's something that surely wouldn't age well. Oh, it's yeah. something that twenty years later people would go. It's kind of now you listen to uh, the audio from say an old western. And all of the bullets seem to make a sharp ricochet sound. What I'm getting at is by being a comedy, you could have these effects that when you pay a little, when you don't pay any attention to them, it still feels like great solid action. If you pay a little bit of attention, then they're kind of silly. It's it's clearly over the top. Um, There's, uh, you know, other little things they get away with because it's, it's jokes too that seem like uh, more elaborate editing than it, it probably really is. Mm-hmm. You know, there's that scene where they're kind of describing what's happening on TV. Right. And Sean is oblivious, just as he is to the, the blood in the uh, convenience store. Right. And as he's flipping through the channels, it's, um, you know, he's flipping through news coverage and different uh, Discovery Channel or whatever, nature footage. And it's actually describing what's sure. happening it's using, making full sentences, but right. he's flipping through channels. Something that just uh, employs creativity yep. over a really complicated effects work. And that's how most good effects work is. You know, if you're using uh, some great creativity, you're doing something that probably other people aren't doing. And so audiences haven't seen it a million times. Mm-hmm. They have no idea how it's done. It's a, it's a clever magic trick. So the zombies have been talked to death. And we covered the waking dead job work stuff. That uh, people need to, you know, do things that they are passionate about, sure. and that they want to talk about, and not where they mentally check out when they clock right. in. One other thing I did want to talk about as far as a, a direction style sure. is uh, this movie has, actually it has the uh, the other survivor group, which I almost forgot about, yeah. um, which they come across that looks just like their survivor yeah. group. Love it. And they milk that to the point of walking past. Uh-huh. Uh, and each of them responding to each other the yeah, same way. Yeah, exactly. But what I was going to mention is the what's possibly the best crane shot of all time. Uh-huh. 
Um, I really don't like crane work. I don't like right. big epic effects work. Not as into or, the ending, one of the endings of Toxic Avenger as you may have wished you were. Yeah, I did complain about the crane stuff enough <laughs> on that. And we've talked about that with uh, Spielberg doing big crane. I mean, it's uh, not to say there's anything artistically wrong about it. It's just not my style. Yeah, sure. I like smaller, more intimate totally stuff. Totally can understand not liking a crane shot. However, there's a crane shot used in here for kind of a joke that's maybe not typically what you would use a crane shot mm -hmm. for. And the camera work really does a great job of making it even just a little bit funnier. It's the scene where Sean walks, uh, he walks up out of the frame on a tiny little plastic uh, slide to see what's over the fence. Sure. And so the camera is stationary. It's as if the camera can't even point up at him. It's like a, just as if a, it were a dog. Right. It's on ground level. And he walks out of the frame, his head pokes out, he walks back down and gives, you know, Simon Pegg his excellent performances and reactions oh my God. all throughout this movie. So great. Uh, comes back down and he says, you know what, it looks pretty bad. And then the camera, unexpectedly, of course, because it seems like it's only going to sure. be a ground view, actually pans up and pulls back to reveal how awful the dire situation yeah. is. It's shots like these, and the editing and the effects... And also the constant collaboration with people who are, are pretty great inventive writers. Sure. That make Edgar Wright really the, the name that he is. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites for sure. So in a backwards way, we, uh, we covered all of Shaun of the Dead. And of course, we covered the crap out of uh, Glenn Gary, <laughs> Glenn Ross. So really, there's an email address, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. That website, one more time. In case it's you... uh, doublefeatureshow.com. There you go. You can go on the page for this episode and find links to some of the stuff uh, that we talked about that I said, hey, you should probably go see that, and then it just got too hard and you didn't look for it. Mm -hmm. So next time on the show, we're getting back to something that we've been trying to get back to for a little while. Yeah, uh, we're, the petting the white cat theory. Certainly. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a so slightly different lineup of directors. Mm -hmm. This time One we're going to... lineup of Well, directors. we still have our Argento, right? We're going right. to cover another Argento film. Uh, there's some more stuff we want to talk about with Argento and with this specific movie. Also, we're going to get back into Takashi Miike. Which we saw with Sukiyaki, Western Django. Yeah, so we're delivering on a previous promise that we're going to figure out what the fuck is going on with this director and move into uncomfortable territory. Cool. So movie-wise, Ichi the Killer and Opera? That's definitely going to be what it is. And it's going to be slightly more accessible than uh, than you might think. All right, watch more fucking film. Bye.